I'm going to kick off by um, giving a, an overview of the Open Group. I'm going to talk about uh, what the Open Group has been, uh, has been doing and what we, <coughs> what we are working on currently. I said to those of you who were in the Open Platform 3.0 track yesterday that um, a lot of people think of us as, uh, originally thought of us as the Unix company. That's sort of where we started and now people tend to think of us as the EA company or the TOGAF company. There's a lot more going on than that. So um, you'll hear about one of those in some detail today, IT for IT. But there's a lot more too, so I'm just going to give you an overview of, of uh, what we're up to and, and hopefully you'll be surprised. So the Open Group is, is um, a consortium of organizations, not individuals. You have to be an organization of some kind to be a member of the Open Group, unlike the Association of Enterprise Architects, which is for individuals. We have now over 500 memberships signed with us around the world, as you can see from 42 countries. Our global presence, our global uh, reach is something we're very proud of, and, uh, and it continues to grow. Um, in, over the course of last year, we added 92 new membership agreements um, from 25 countries, I think. They, they are here on this slide and this slide. Um, two new countries to us overall in the year, Morocco and Zambia. Um, but it's something that uh, it is, is something we're very proud of, the, the global nature of it. Um, the organizations that, that joined um, tend to join for a specific area of interest. So the standard um, membership in the Open Group is something called Silver. And that's uh, an area of, of uh, th that means that you're a member of one forum, one area of interest. It might be architecture, it might be security, it might be IT for IT. But that's how we divide up our, our work groups effectively. We call them forums. Um, and over the course of last year, we had new members join in, in all of these forums you can see here. Archimate, I'll talk to what, what each of these are um, in different degrees of detail shortly, but um, the Archimate Forum, Architecture, IT for IT, Open Platform 3.0 Security, and the Open Trusted Technology Forum. Um, we also had new members in the Healthcare Forum, the Exploration, Mining, Metals and Minerals Group, which is easier to say at the beginning of the day than later. We had some new gold members. Uh, gold membership in the Open Group is where you participate in most of the forum activities um, that we have. So <clears throat> there are one or two that are, are not included in gold, but basically it's most of what we do if you're a gold member. And we had a new platinum member in the year, Huawei from uh, China. They they joined us and they've uh, they've brought quite a lot of energy um, and uh, and people and resource into the into the organisation. So, the way that that people participate in the Open Group is. Um, is it, it, a, a number of ways. A lot of our work is done virtually. By virtue of the, the global spread, not everyone can get together face to face like we are this morning. Um, so a lot of the work is done virtually, but we do put on a number of, of face to face events. And um, taking those virtual events and the face to events in total, over the course of last year, had, we had um, 51,000 people attended an open group event. Um, which is quite a number. The, the cities listed there were the, the cities where we held face-to-face um, -face events, and then we had a number of webinars and podcasts, which are increasingly popular. They allow people who can't travel to the other events to participate. So I'll put the numbers up. Uh, there's only one I'm going to actually refer you to. You can, you can read the numbers, but um, we do have an active... Uh, an active group following our blog. The way that the Open Group blog is, um, has taken off in the last year and a half has been, uh, has been very pleasing to us. Active LinkedIn groups, um, Twitter followers. This is the one I want to really bring your attention to. Nearly 7 million page views on the Open Group website last year. Um, that's quite something for an organization of our size and something we're very proud of. In terms of virtual participation, in WebEx meetings last year, 
this is this is as I say a way of getting us uh, participation from from people who can't travel. Um, we had 11,788 person hours. So, to save you doing the math, that's 572 days of effort on WebExes. And if you look at the online collaboration um, activities, um, that's a 47% increase on the previous year. Um, more than 20,000 people participating. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, you, I don't expect you to be able to read what those uh, individual bars are on there, um, especially on uh, on this projector, but um, it, it's uh, it's spread across some. There's there's a big bulk that you can see in the middle, sort of a turquoisey colour, depending on what it looks like on your screen. Um, that's the face consortium, which I'll talk to in a bit. So upcoming face-to-face -face events, we have our next uh, quarterly event in in London um, in April. And uh, we have four, uh, four such events during the year, uh, usually two in the US, um, two in Europe, sometimes two US, one Europe, and one um, somewhere else. So, um, but they're, they're set for this year um, as London, Austin, Texas, and Paris. Um, we've got uh, a regional meeting coming up in Japan. Um, we have a, a a long track record of participation from Japanese companies in the open group and uh, uh, we have they have some quite uh, quite vibrant local events um, and then Jakarta Indonesia we also had representation earlier this week at pink 16 um, which is we were there specifically because of IT for IT um, and the RSA conference is a big security industry conference that's coming up in San Francisco uh, a week after next, I think. And um, we have a stand there and uh, members, members uh, help us man our, our uh, exhibit stand. And um, it's a good, uh, good ground for us to tell people what we're doing in the security space. So one of the things we're known for, obviously, is enterprise architecture, um, TOGAF specifically. So the two jewels in the crown are TOGAF and Archimate. Um, I'll, I'll come to Archimate in a moment, but um, TOGAF, a big part of the growth is around certification. And last year we, we uh, exceeded 50,000 individuals around the world are now certified in TOGAF 9. There, were, there was a um, certification program for TOGAF 8 too, but this is just TOGAF 9, more than 50,000 now. Um, and there's a whole ecosystem around this. and. Um, our sponsors out, outside uh, Panastra and SNA Technologies are two of those organizations who help build that number through their training and, and uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful um, community. Um, and many of you in this room I know are, are TOGAF certified and um, if you're not, do think about it. Um, the top 10 countries for TOGAF certification, India is number three, um, which is quite impressive. The UK and the US had an unfair start um, with it, really, but um, because of where the initial training organizations were based. So India is, is uh, certainly an area where, that, where we are seeing a lot of TOGAF certifications. Now, I heard yesterday... Um, um, uh, Palab was saying that that uh, uh, Bangalore was possibly the number one city in the world in terms of TOGAF certifications. Well, I've good news and bad news. The bad news is it isn't anymore. Um, but the good news is if you look at the top ten, four of them are in India. So, well done to all of you. Um, that really is really is quite something. So uh, thank you for that. Um, it's, really, it's really very impressive. So we expect, um, we expect that to, we actually expect that to continue. Um, and the p places may even change. I'm still not quite sure why London is number one, but apparently it is. So um, also I said about 50,000 uh, certifications. We had more than 80, well, 81 and a half thousand downloads of TOGAF uh, related materials last year from 166 different countries and more than 15,000 TOGAF books were sold. 
There's a big interest in TOGAF, a big community. So why is that? Well, here are some of the things that, w that we hear. Um, and the one, I'll, I'll let you read the slide, but the, the one that I would call out myself is, it provides, apart from anything else, it provides a common language. It provides a way for people to communicate when they're going about enterprise architecture in a consistent way. And that saves a lot of time, a lot of heartache, and um, can really help, really help the EA project get off the ground. 80% of large businesses use TOGAF. It depends which businesses you look at, but when you look at things like the Forbes 100, the, the uh, Global 500, it's, it's used just about everywhere um, and widely adopted by governments. So on the government point, we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about governments. Uh, does anyone remember who the number one ranked government in the world was from an e-government e point of view from Korea. Korea, absolutely. And it, here's something to back that up. Um, Palab actually had uh, 2014 statistics yesterday, but um, it was the same in 2010, 2012, and again in 2014. Um, undisputed e-government leader. And we would say part of the reason that is, is they are using TOGAF. If you look at this is the south, this is a few charts from the South Korea government-wide enterprise architecture. They have taken TOGAF and they have created what works for them, which is the key message about TOGAF. You don't try and ingest all 800 pages of it and follow it slavishly. Adapt it for what works for your organisation, and in this case, what works for the Korean government. Um, but it's very, very recognizable. We have lots of other examples of this kind of thing going on. Um, uh, South Africa is another one. They've got something very similar, government-wide enterprise architecture based very closely on TOGAF. Um, Canada, all federal government projects use TOGAF for enterprise architecture. They have a direct link to our website on their on the Canadian government intranet. Um, actively encourage people to use it. Same for Finland. The UK is a, is a bit mixed in terms of the government, but there are some some ministries, some departments where it's very strong. And the quote there is from the. Um, uh, HM Revenue and Customs. Um, they they are basically have adopted TOGAF, as has the the biggest department um, in the UK government, which is the Department of Works and Pensions. Botswana, I haven't put anything down there. They have just um, taken a decision, which. Uh, I'm not sure if it's public or it's about to be public, but um, they have taken a decision to basically do the same and require TOGAF usage for all enterprise architecture work in Botswana. And closer to home, of course, or closer to this home, <coughs> we heard yesterday about the great stuff that's going on uh, in Andhra Pradesh. Um, now, yes, TOGAF is a part of that, but what's even more pleasing from an open group part point of view is it's not just about TOGAF, it's about embracing the vision that we have been working with for 15 years of, of boundaryless information flow. So if you take a look at um, some of the materials from Andhra Pradesh, it, it is clearly um, directly uh, related to boundaryless information flow. It, it says all the same things if you look on our website about our mission and vision. It's, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. So it's so pleasing to see this being embraced. We, we feel it's as relevant now as it ever was when we started with this uh, vision 15 years ago. And clearly we're not alone. Um, also, fairly close to here, we have Bangladesh. I'm not sure if you can actually, actually read that, but the government of Bangladesh is using TOGAF. Um, now, a lot of that is down to... Um, consulting organizations um, going in and and explaining how the use of TOGAF can help this. And one of the things that we hope for the future is that we'll see a lot more of this in government. Um, and uh, we think there are lots of opportunities to take what's been done in, in some of these uh, territories and broaden that out. So it's a great success story for TOGAF. Um, and uh, we want to make sure it continues. Um, talking of... Um, the Architecture Forum of the Open Group is the 
body that works on evolving the standard and they have been busy for some time now on working out what happens next with TOGAF. Um, what would the next version of TOGAF look like? And the direction they're, they're going in, they're, they're by no means um, certain yet, but the direction they're going in is to basically break TOGAF up into uh, essentially um, some core elements and then a series of guides that help the implementation. Um, also a big, a big um, addition to the next version will be beefing up the security aspects of TOGAF. That's one of the criticisms in the past of TOGAF. It's a bit light on security. So we've actually had the security forum in the open group working with the architecture forum to um, get some security expertise in there and, and uh, there'll be a big difference there. Um, and they're also uh, working on a capa capability-based planning project jointly with the Archimate Forum. Talking of Archimate, Archimate is, that's the Wikipedia definition that you probably can't read, but basically it's a modeling language for doing enterprise architecture is how I would say it. It's, um, it fits very nicely with TOGAF, lots of the same terminology. Um, it, it's not TOGAF doesn't mandate the use of Archimate. You can use Archimate far more broadly than when you're following TOGAF 2. It's, it's pretty, um, pretty broad in its application. And one of the things we introduced in the third quarter of last year was the um, Archimate model exchange file format. And that is basically where, where models are created using, using Archimate, no matter what tool they're created in, they can be portable and interchangeable through this through this exchange file format. So that's proving uh, to be very valuable for those using Archimate. Um, they too are working on a new version, which is likely to be um, produced around about the middle of this year, um, second quarter of this year. Um, the uh, company review process it says on there that's what we that's the uh, one of the way, one of the uh, procedures that we use in the open group for getting standards agreed and published that is underway um, and that gives every member of the open group the opportunity to um, uh, participate in the review of the next standard um, the other thing I'm, I'm not so worried about the forum survey, but the the models repository. This is this is I think a great thing. That I, I mentioned that models can be can be formed using different different tools, but trying to get some of those models put into a repository. Actually, having produced uh, a reference architecture version two, which came out in October last year, and last month we announced the manager's guide um, for IT for IT. A lot of work has been done by a lot of people um, to get to that point. Um, there was a group of organizations who were working on this before they came to the open group. They had something to go with and they had some ideas about uh, a reference architecture, but they came to us two years ago um, saying, okay, we've got this far, we need, we need some help in going further and, and spreading this internationally. And uh, we're very happy with what we've, what we've done with those members. Um, what is it about? It's about managing the business of IT. Um, their latest publication is, just came out this, this month, in fact last week I think, which is a white paper on um, IT for IT and Agile. So um, it's, uh, it's worth a read. Um, so yeah, it's about managing the business of IT for IT. So what's the problem? The, the, the problem, as we know, is that IT activity inside an organization doesn't always um, uh, get conducted in an integrated way. Um, things happen, um, there's no, not usually any overall plan, and the way that business is, uh, or the way that technology is changing with, with all sorts of things like cloud, agility, mobility, bring your own device, all of those things um, are proving very challenging for IT departments. They're also required, as we heard yesterday, required to do more with less money. Um, so there's a big, big budget constraints. Um, how might we tackle that? Well, what IT for IT does is, is it provides um, a reference architecture for managing the business of IT. It's 
based on, or a, a key concept of it is value chains, which is actually something that Michael Porter wrote about quite a few years ago now. But um, it's it's a great a great concept if you compare IT for IT to how things have historically been done. Um, uh, which I'll come to in just a moment, that there are value propositions. These are things we've heard from the organizations that are participating. So we've kind of divided them up into customers. But for customers, large customers of IT, the, the ability to track cost, performance, and business value um, and, and reduce risk is important. Um, total cost of ownership is something we hear a lot about. This helps with that. For the software vendors, they can deliver integrated solutions at lower cost and an opportunity to focus on differentiating innovation. So the stuff that is above the, the standard, standard stuff that everybody would expect. What is their, their secret source or what is their particular value add? For integrators, and the company names listed here are listed because they are from the membership of the IT for IT forum, so there are obviously other examples, even in this room, of the uh, of the integrator um, category. Um, but there are there are. I'll let you, you you read those. But what I really want to say about it, because you'll hear from experts on it later um, more than me, um, the organisations building it um, are pretty widespread. Those custom those customer groups, the service providers and consultants, and the vendors come together nicely to to um, give a, a different uh, set of perspectives and really help bring value to the standard. Um, uh, there are some great, I mean, I'll, if I were to pick <coughs> one customer out from, from the list, it would be Shell. Um, if you go to the Open Group website, um, there are some great presentations um, from Shell employees on what the value is to them. They have embraced it absolutely completely and um, and continue to do so. Um, so it's uh, this is a quick quick look at what's there. Um, the value chain concept, I'll, uh, the next slide will say a bit more about that, but it, it basically takes us from the why to the what and then the reference architecture takes us from the what to the how. Um, um, and it's, as they like to say, it's all about the data. It's in there. It, you can use various models. Yeah, it's very flexible. Um, so what's different about it? Well, the traditional viewpoint of IT was um, plan, build, deliver, and run. This takes a more integrated view. The integrated word is one that comes up a lot. You can see that the, um, that the value chains are linked together. Um, so the value chains there, uh, the four basic value chains are strategy to portfolio, which is really about, in IT terms, making sure that the right investments are made. And then requirement um, to deploy is about um, it, it, in <laughs> It's uh, the way the way I'd describe it is it, it's about creating and maintaining quality um, delivery in the IT department. Um, the request uh, to fulfil is about IT having having a catalogue so that they know that that service delivery can can be performed in a, in an organised way um, and. Uh, detect to correct is basically maintaining it as things come up they need you know the shop needs to keep running and that's really what that aspect is so you'll hear more about that from uh, people more technical than me but it's uh, it's a great a, a great approach a great way of looking at it and there are people who've already used it uh, for real um, who have some some great case studies to tell um, this is the release train. This is how we got to where we were, how where we are. Um, the January 2013 date um, was was when they really came to the open group, and uh, we created a forum around that. Uh, it's a very active group, very busy group, and they are uh, constantly working on evolving it, uh, making it more usable, um, and uh, and spreading the word. A quote from Gartner, um, again, I'll let you read it, but the important bit is down the bottom. Um, it, Gartner estimates that for a one billion per annum IT function, the benefit of using IT for IT could be saving of five to 20% of the total budget. So it's not to be sneezed at. Where it fits in the overall IT 
uh, landscape. Um, it's pretty broad. Uh, it's pretty broad application. Um, it it uh, it doesn't replace ITIL. Is one of the questions we get asked a lot. It doesn't replace ITIL. It's it's uh, compatible with it as it is with using TOGAF with it as it is with various other um, uh, frameworks and and uh, methods that you might be using. Pretty broad application. So I'll switch from IT for IT. As I say, we'll hear more about that. Um, Open Platform 3.0. This is about the convergence of some of the uh, technologies that we've seen coming at us over the last few years. Uh, mobile, big data, Internet of Things, bring your own device, as I said, cloud, SOA. Um, what does that mean for the, for the platform? What does that mean for a digital business? Um, all of this stuff is is great if you can take advantage of it, but it's also really threatening <laughs> if you can't. Um, so, uh, finding what, what we're trying to do in the in the forum is to find um, a platform. What is the platform that that this stuff can operate on? Um, maybe not the exclusive platform, but what can we bring together um, to? Uh, uh, assist or enable organizations to take advantage of the opportunities that these technologies offer um, and transform their businesses accordingly. Um, so it, they're working on effectively building blocks for the digital, um, digital IT or digital business. Um, and uh, architectural patterns. Um, one of the th one of the obvious things that that an organisation inside the Open Group will will look at is, okay, how can we leverage the architecture expertise in the in the organisation in the membership? Um, so taking a look at, at some of the architecture patterns for what that th that third platform might be is important. And we have history with um, with platforms. As I said at the beginning, we started with with Unix. And, uh, and brought the various flavors of Unix together in the single Unix specification. Um, and one of the things we're doing is trying to learn from previous platforms when we're, when we're looking, thinking about what the third platform might be. Um, we do have two published standards in that space in the Internet of Things area, the open messaging interface and the open data format. Um, there's a quote there that I hope you can read, but... Um, uh, this was from a, a, a professor in, in Finland who, who says that, that together these standards can do for the Internet of Things what HTTP and HTML did for the Internet. So let's hope he's right. There's, more, there's much more to be done in this space, but um, we do have a good start. They do have a, um, a snapshot of what the first version of the open platform might be. A snapshot in open group terms is, is, a, is when something is published saying this is the direction that the standard looks to be going in, and, it, and we look for feedback from the community as to uh, is this the right direction, what have we got right, what have we got wrong. One of the new activities in this space is the Digital Business Strategy and Customer Experience Workgroup. And uh, uh, this is something that, uh, that our, our new Platinum member I mentioned, Huawei, are, are driving quite hard. They come from a, a telco background, um, still obviously very active in the telco, but they are looking to bring some of the work that they've done in, in changing the customer experience in that industry to other industries by working with, with partners there in, in different industries. Um, the other thing I'd pick out from there was uh, there's a business data lake fast track going through right now. We heard in the, in the track yesterday, those of you who were there, about business data lakes um, and what a data lake is. And we have a, a, a starting point for what that might be in open group terms um, going through review during, during the process at the moment. It's actually being contributed as a starting point by Cap Gemini. Um, so uh, that's uh, a lot of activity there as well and a, a broad scope. Um, other forum activity. Uh, I mentioned Open Trusted Technology Forum. They are focused on mitigating the risk of maliciously tainted and counterfeit products in the supply chain. So what they have worked on to date is a standard um, and an and accreditation program which enables vendors to to make a statement, public statement, um, accredit their their um, product line, saying we know where every part of this 
um, every component in in this product line comes from, and we're we're absolutely certain that it's not tainted, malicious, etc. And if it is. Uh, if it proves to be, then then we'll we'll fix things um, it, much along the same lines as as Unix certification has been in the Open Group for a long time. Um, so it's quite it, it, it's it's very interesting to government, of course. It's very interesting to anyone that buys a lot of um, a lot of uh, IT or a lot of systems. And in fact, we're we're proud that it's just become a a formal ISO standard. So the Open Group has a has a status um, with ISO, PAS status, that allows us to take some of our standards, submit them to ISO on a sort of fast track basis. So that's now a formal ISO standard. Um, and what that group is working on, um, IBM were the first to step up to the accreditation program. And uh, their case study on how they did that and the benefits to them and what they learned along the way uh, is underway. That's what uh, one of the things that they're working on, as well as a white paper. And for those of you, if any, who are involved in uh, with any any um, cybersecurity NIST stuff in the U.S., um, there's an implementation implementation guide that they're working on there. Um, so that's OTTF. Um, the Security Forum. Security Forum's had a long history in the Open Group. Um, we've done various things. Their recent focus, I would say, for the last couple of years has been more on risk um, than, than broader security. Um, uh, they are also, as I say, uh, con working with the Architecture Forum on the security aspects of the next version of TOGAF, but uh, a lot of the focus has been on risk. And in there, they've, they've created um, something called Open Fair. Um, it's based on, um, well, I'll, I'll come to that in just a moment. Um, Open Fair is basically uh, based on two, uh, two standards. Um, we also have uh, OISM3, which is a, a framework for managing information security. There are some interesting case studies on using that in particularly the financial services world, some of the banks. So Open Fair is based on um, two uh, two standards. Um, it's a certification of people program, somewhat like TOGAF and Archimate, and it's based on uh, uh, the body of knowledge for that is two standards: the Open Risk tax Taxonomy and the Open Risk Analysis. And um, I know those of you who were at our Open Group event in Bangalore last year heard a presentation on that by uh, by Bill Estrom. Um, and that is one that we need to, uh, it, it's, it's very broadly um, applicable, um, is, is probably a good way of putting it. The, some of the early interest has been in insurance companies and um, financial services organizations. Um, which some of them in the US in particular are training their people in this. And um, uh, inter interestingly, my son is also um, using it at his uh, university, on his university course, um, which was uh, something new. Um, other forums, Open Real Time and Embedded Systems Forum, they do a lot of work, particularly in the military space and the government space. Um, they're working on MILS, multiple independent levels of security APIs for critical systems. So uh, it, the kinds of systems where it's really important that real time means real time um, is what they're working at. Things like so that when a, a, a fighter pilot pushes the button, um, things happen when they're supposed to. Uh, that's, that's one example. And the Open Group Base Work Group is around the single unit specification. That's a, uh, an activity that, that uh, evolves that specification gradually um, in conjunction with ISO and IEEE. Um, so, Industry verticals, that's also something we have. Um, the Healthcare Forum, um, they have been doing a lot of work on what the healthcare landscape is. Um, there's obviously a lot of potential uh, efficiency opportunities in the healthcare industry around, around the world, and uh, they are looking at how s some kind of standardization can, uh, can help achieve some of those things. So they've taken a look at the, the landscape um, so far of what the healthcare industry is on an international basis. Uh, FACE I'll come to in just a moment, and then the other one that's uh, a vertical is the Exploration Mining Metals and Minerals Forum. They have a 
uh, a very well thought of uh, reference architecture for that industry. Um, and I think it's actually probably something that is a good starting point for reference architectures for other industries. We just haven't gone there quite yet. David's nodding, I see. Um, so the FACE Consortium. Um, this is about um, this is about avionics. Um, this uh, traditionally avionics, um, th particularly military avionics, they are designed by by large parts of them at least are designed by one organisation. You ha you basically have a giant system that you buy from from one uh, major supplier. They may have obviously had contributions to that system from other organisations, but basically you get tied in from a customer point of view. Um, think of a Department of Defence, for example, customer point of view, you get tied into certain um, ways of doing things with certain suppliers. What FACE is about is really um, providing a common environment for uh, avionic systems. Um, in my words, the, the cockpit of the future is, is a good way of looking at it. And the approach is, is, is to move away from this kind of monolithic system to something more like an app store, um, which sounds a bit scary when it's in planes, but the, the concept being you can buy the, that you can buy what you want from different vendors and they'll plug and play together because they're, they're all going to be compatible, compliant with a, a common environment. So that's what FACE is about. Um, as you see, there are now more than a thousand individual participants participating from the member organisations in that. It's a really vibrant group. I was at one of their meetings um, a couple of weeks ago when they were demonstrating, various, various vendors were demonstrating uh, what, where they had got to so far in using this. Um, and it's, it's getting put in procurements, which is a really good indicator that it's going to be real. So um, it's a US only activity um, because of some of the security aspects uh, or encryption aspects involved. Um, we hope that will change because there is interest in this same kind of thing from uh, from other governments other than the US, but it's um, it's been a great activity so far. And it's about to spawn something called SOSA, which is um, the sensor open systems um, architecture. Um, so this is taking it currently it, it started in inside face but it's going it's going to um, go out on its own inside inside the open group but as a separate forum um, and is more broadly applicable it's basically anything where sensors are important so it's not just military application and then lastly I started by mentioning Unix um, first time for a, quite a long time there is considerable interest and effort and, and real activity from the Unix system vendors to rejuvenate uh, the Unix standard and the Unix brand um, it's sort of reached a point where there's Unix and Linux and some people think Unix is old and Linux is new and the reality is that they're so so close together that that isn't necessarily the case but so we're going to put some effort, in, or are putting some effort into um, some work in, in Unix and uh, you know, uh, extolling the virtues, what it's all about. Um, and uh, it's pleasing to see we've had a number of attempts at doing this over the over the years that I've been with the organisation, and they've always <coughs> crashed on the rock of the product marketing people inside the individual organisations because they'd rather promote their own versions spend their money on promoting their own versions rather than the commonality. There seems to be a sense now that it's time to promote the commonality as well. So uh, that's potentially quite exciting for us. And a final thought. Uh, this is a quote that uh, some of you may have seen before, but um, have a choice. You can either create your own future or become the victim of a future that somebody else creates for you. Um, a call to action of participation. Um, many of you are, are here from member organisations of the Open Group and uh, we'd love you to, uh, to participate um, actively if you don't already. And for those of you who aren't members, then uh, hopefully you've got a sense of s some of the things that are going on that might uh, entice you to join us. So. That's all I have to say. Um, happy to take any questions if there if there are any. There's one question over this table here, James. Okay. Sorry, could you repeat? UML question? standard and Archimate standard. UML and Archimate. Archimate is is sort of at a higher level than than UML. Then they're, they're not 
mutually exclusive, they can be used with each other. In fact, there's a white paper on using them, uh, using them together. But UML tends to take you down much deeper uh, when you're using it. And for me, um, with, with my non-technical background, if I look at UML um, diagrams and models, uh, they don't mean anything to me. Uh, if I look at an Archimate thing, it's at a level that I can, I can comprehend. Um, so it's, it's a question of different levels, really. Um, they are, I mean, they don't even look the same, but they, you can use them together and people do use them together. We actually have an activity going on with um, OMG, which is the, the standards body responsible for uh, UML, um, to work further on, uh, on positioning the two and how they, uh, how they might work together or creating a, an Archimate um, uh, specific element inside UML. So there. But there, there, is a, there is a white paper on our website about uh, how they can be used together. Any more? Hi, Steve. Uh, here. Ah. Uh, thank you for that right, uh, right. comprehensive overview. Uh, my question is on Archimede as well. Uh, what tools do you recommend uh, for, uh, you know, using Archimate Sweet. and currently we are using a tool Archie uh, but uh, there is a problem it is you know when teams work together using Archie they are not able to share uh, the models or version control or uh, you know reuse things like a uh, system architecture right so right. is there are there any uh, work going on in creating a more comprehensive tool for Archimate <coughs> Uh, yes, yes, there is. Um, we um, Archie is there to. I mean, it's an open source. It's you know, you, you can take it, you can use it, and it's a, it's a good starting point. But obviously, it does have its uh, its limitations. Um, what we can't do as the open group, because neutrality is our is our most important word, really. Um, we can't recommend particular tools from particular vendors, but what I can tell you is we do have a um, certification program for Archimate tools. So we would point you to the register of Archimate tools um, and say all of those have stepped up to be, um, to be certified by us. Um, so uh, pick from them. Okay. But there are individuals here I know who could probably give you, exp uh, uh, give you a, um, their experience of using various different tools, but, um, but I, I can't point you to one, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, my question is also on Archimate. Yes. I'm sorry, there's a bright light. Ah, there yeah, we go. Fine. Right, gotcha. So, where, the, where we found the overlap in the Archimate is the BMM business motivation model and the BPM and notations. Right. Is there any work done to make this notation seamlessly work together? Is there any roadmap on that? Uh, there is um, a cooperative project with, um, uh, with OMG, as I mentioned, about uh, bringing the two closer together or at least making it easier to use the two. Um, I can't give you a, a roadmap or a timeline for that. Um, but if you see me afterwards, I can put you in touch with the, the people who might be able to do that. Um, I know there is activity there. It's just there. There are um, so many things they're trying to deal with at the same time. It's a question of which one they, uh, they spend time on. So. I think there was one, one more. Yeah. Making you work, James. He's quicker. He's, <laughs> he's, he's running. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what visible benefits are seen after TOGA certification? Sorry. What, what uh, visible benefits are seen in the industry after TOGA certifications? Um, so where would you go after TOGA certification? What would? Yeah. What visible benefits are seen in the industry? Basically, after TOGAC certification, you said that Bangalore or Hyderabad are having more number of TOGAC certified TOGAC certified persons. So. Uh, what are the visible benefits seen in the industry as such? Do you want me to respond to that? Yes. Um, I think one of, one of, one of the here. reasons why um, India is very high on the list for TOGAF certifications is because the customers of the companies they work for are demanding architects who are certified. Um, there's a big demand, particularly currently in the Western markets, from both government and commercial customers uh, for TOGAF certified people. 
Um, so th that's basically the, the virtuous circle. And um, you'd have heard yesterday uh, the amount of work that's now going on in India. Uh, there's increasing demand within India also for, for enterprise architects and for TOGAF certification. Um, there's a, a, a useful survey that's done every quarter by a company called um, Foot. The foot, the, report. the foot Report, F O O T E. They do a US um, quarterly salary survey um, against certifications. You'll find TOGAF is pretty much near the top. Um, it's sort of second only to OpenCA. Uh, so, there's basically for the individual, particularly if you are in the US, you earn more money. Um, that may or may not be true in this country because there's no surveys, I don't know, but it, there's, there's increasing demand worldwide, which is what's driving the people to do it, because there's increasing demand for enterprise architects, and currently TOGAF is the most common, it's the de facto standard that people are using as their method, um, so it has that direct benefit both to the employers and to the individuals who achieve certification, so it's a good thing. Next, any more questions? Hi. One more. Uh, hi, Steve. Hi. So my question is, uh, Open Platform 3.0, I understand, has uh, an offshoot, which is open public sector data. Uh, I know there's a business scenario and a white paper that was published on your website. Uh, could you throw some light on what's happening on that front, the open public sector data front? Is there something that you're taking beyond just that business scenario that you've documented? Uh, to be honest, I'm not aware of anything going beyond beyond that. What the, what the forum has done is taken a, a look at a number of different industries, um, a number of different use cases. I think 21 they've done so far. Um, and some of them have, res have resulted in white papers. Um, when, they've, when they've kind of gone through that stage, it's then, okay, which of these are we going to focus on next to go through and, and, um, uh, and do more on? So right now I'm not aware of anything specific in that, in that space, but um, uh, the way it works is if there's an interest in the forum in diving down further into that into that group, then that's going to happen rather than another industry. So it really depends on where the interest of the members in the forum are. So, so as an extension to that, as a practitioner and someone who's passionate about open data, is there any way that one could engage with that forum that you just mentioned? Uh, how would you really go about engaging with that forum and the members out there? Um, well. Um, uh, it basically means um, being a member of the Open Platform Forum, yeah, uh, and then participating in the uh, yeah. In, and and you know, since since I understand IBM is are. one of your platinum members out there, That's I, right. I would have thought it should not be so much of a challenge getting to interact with that forum and probably contributing to what it, is what is to be done on that front of the public sector it, data. It, absolutely, it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a challenge. So is your is your challenge that? that things happen in the wrong time zones or everything's <laughs> no, remote? The challenge or? is more about the fact that I do not know how to go about it in ah. approaching that forum, getting, getting that going with them. Well, as a, as a Platinum member, uh, all, all employees of Platinum members are able to go into our system and subscribe to the relevant forums of their choice through our system. Um, so you, you're, you can do that um, yourself. Um, I suggest okay. to fast track that process, we might talk afterwards and I can, put you in, I can then put you in direct touch with the forum director, Chris Harding, and he'll, he'll be able to uh, guide you through that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. M my suggestion is try it online now. If you fail to do it by the coffee break, uh, we'll help you out. <laughs> But I, I'll do an introduction to Chris anyway, because uh, that, uh, that will help you uh, make sure that you're with the right people. Uh, hi, Steve. I have one question. Mm. Okay. Uh, as an open group, when we say enterprise architecture, now nowadays the definition of the enterprise is moving from the large scale to the small scale. There are a lot of startups. Now, when we say TOGAP certified architect, we are reachable to the only enterprise architect like a MNC level. Now most of the startups want to adopt these uh, standards, but the reachability is very less. From the organization, what are your plans to create a reference architecture that can be useful for the startups? Even they are having a kind of a hundred members with the scale of software engineering to the till senior software engineering. 
Yeah, it, it, it's something that um, that we do here a lot. A lot of the organisations that um, that have the case studies and and have used TOGAF tend to be the larger ones. Um, there aren't too many case studies that that uh, I'm aware of 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 use inside a small organization. Um, one that I am aware of is is actually one we did ourselves inside the Open Group. Uh, I was personally involved in that um, a few years ago um, where we, we tried to, well we didn't just try, we did put ourselves in the shoes of a small organization which is what we are in terms of staff um, and say okay we don't have an architecture team, how do we go about implementing TOGAF? Um, so there is a white paper on that published that, that I would refer you to on the website. In terms of a reference architecture for startups, um, it's, a great, it's a great idea. Um, it's a question of uh, the resource in the forum to to do that. They're focused on the next version of TOGAF, but that may be very good input into maybe that's something that should be there in the guides. How do you? Maybe there should be a guide for small. There, is, there is. I know talk of uh, of a guide already for small, medium sized enterprises using TOGAF. Um, but I'm not aware of a specific activity to create a reference architecture. Um, it's really a question of what what the members in the forum w want to do. We can we can suggest it certainly. We can uh, uh, tell them we think it would be a good thing. But they're the ones that would need to create it. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is, uh, whilst it's far from a startup organisation, um, one of the most fascinating examples of taking TOGAF when they hadn't even heard of it and using it is BAE Systems. Um, these are the people that produce submarines in the UK. Um, we had a great presentation, a series of presentations from them at our London event last year. Um, <clears throat> somebody came in and said, you need to go look at this TOGAF thing. <clears throat> and uh, they did. And they, they knew nothing about enterprise architecture, never even heard the words, um, but uh, went in, looked at TOGAF. Um, and as they describe it, they took out a black pen and they deleted, because they didn't understand it, they deleted every word that had more than three syllables in TOGAF. And what they were left with was something that, ah, this could be useful. This could actually really help us. Um, and what they've, so they, they really didn't have the expertise, they didn't have training, they weren't certified, they're now a, a lot more mature in their use of it and they've, they have got people trained. But, but to get going, they took the pocket guide to TOGAF and that's, that's what they went through and tried to make sense of it for their own organization. So, uh, as I say, they're far from a startup organization, but in terms of enterprise architecture maturity, they really were starting from, from the ground, and they had a very small team. There were two people working on this, um, and then they, uh, they broadened it out. But um, it's a great case study, and there is um, a series of presentations on the website that might, might be of interest or might give you some ideas. Um, but in terms of... Uh, in terms of a you know specific reference architecture, um, we don't have we don't have a specific plan for one for for startups, but um, it certainly seems like a good idea, or certainly some guidance on uh, on using TOGAF inside a small organisation. And, um, and, and so may I may I suggest that Infosys, as a member of the Architecture Forum, could create an activity to create to build some reference architecture. Absolutely. I would like to share that. It's one of the, one of the biggest yeah. things and surprises to people, yes. um, and, and Steve talked about it, you know, our members, our members yeah. do all the work. Yes. We as staff, um, we get to talk about it, but we don't do the work. It's our members. The, the analogy we use is we're, we're the personal trainers in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can guide you to the things that will help you and the things that will be there, but you, you, we're not going to do the workout for you. Um, but that, it's... Uh, as somebody once said, a good analogy is like a bucket full of water, uh, a bucket of water with a hole in it. You can only take it so far. So it's a, it's not a perfect one, but it's um, it is the analogy. It's down to the members to uh, to to work there. But that's an activity that certainly would make a lot of sense um, uh, if there's the uh, the will inside the forum to do it. So thank you, Stu. Just I would like to add uh, the suggestion. In Infosys, we started the uh, incubation center for uh, our own engineers. So, 
Yeah, as, as per your suggestion, uh, in Infosys, uh, we have started incubation center for our own employees in Hyderabad, SCG, Pocharam. Then uh, we are running a, a lab for this incubator uh, ideas. So right now we are working on uh, 200 POCs. So we are adapting this open group architecture to create the uh, case study. So we will submit the same to you. That's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. If I can add, I have gone through a presentation from Mark from Business Design. Yeah. Presented on architecture in our agile environment. I think you, you might want to adapt that. Is that Mark Longhurst? Yes. yes. From Biz Design. From Biz Design, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's helpful.